light of the world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here we are here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy you're all together wonderful to me king of all days oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above so humbly he came Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sin became poor. Oh, so here we are, Lord. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you are my God. You're all together lovely, you're all together worthy, you're all together wonderful to me. I believe I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross we say I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross and down never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross no i'll never know how much it costs to see Father, we stand in your presence this morning and 
Sometimes it's all we can say is, here we are. And no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, we never have quite enough. And we try to do it on our own. We don't have enough to bring to you. We don't have enough to honor you with. We don't have the power. Um, But with you by our side, you give us that power. You give us enough to bring. With you on our side and us seeking your heart, God, you give us more than we can ever know because, God, you, you are more than enough for us. And you are altogether lovely and worthy of the praise that we bring. But, God, I pray that it wouldn't start or end with just a song or on a Sunday morning, but it would be something that engulfs our lives and our hearts and our souls. And for us to be part of your kingdom in all that we do and all that we are. I said this morning, God, I I pray that we we would open our hearts more than we ever have before. Open our ears that we may hear and our minds that the heart and soul of Jesus would pour into our soul and we would leave here different than we walked in. And we would worship you each and every day and you would be the center of who we are and what we do. So God, we say here we are. We don't have enough, but in you, we have more than enough. So take us and use us, God. Open our hearts and ears to hear this message and um, let your love continue to flow in this place. You're most glorious heavenly name we pray and we all together we say amen amen you guys can have a seat this morning our text comes from exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 11 and it says this and god spoke all of these words for i am the lord your god who brought you out of egypt out of the land of slavery you shall have no other gods before me You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and is all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, I'm coming up on a big anniversary, basically in in anyone's life. I believe that this is a big deal. Um, but I'm coming up in August. At the end of August, I'm going to be have been a homeowner for a year, and and so that's really cool. Got some equity in the house now, which is nice. But one of the things that, uh, you know, I'll never forget about buying a house, purchasing a home, it was one of the most stressful processes of, of my life because we searched for a home, M and I, for a good six months. We, we started right after we got engaged. We started looking. We were looking at Mandeville, looking in Covington, looking out in Bidico, looking all over the area, trying to find the best deal, something that worked for us. And we finally found the home that we wanted. We put an offer in, and it was a short sale. And so that's a completely different animal in and of itself because you're not negotiating with a person. You're negotiating with a bank. But finally, after what was after we put our offer in, what ended up being a three-month process, we sat down at the table to sign and say that we were going to be a homeowner. And so, actually, I've got a picture of this, Cameron, if you want to throw that up. Um, Em actually grabbed a snapshot of this. Cameron, you got that picture? There it is, right there. It's coming up. Yep, there it is. And so, Em... Em got a picture of this and, and you know, put, took a picture of the house and she split it together and she's like, oh, we own a home. And I'm sitting there thinking, we own a home. Now, if you've never actually purchased a home before, when, when you get to the act of sale, you sign your name. If you sign it once, you sign it a thousand times. You are just signing your name over and over and over again. I finally looked at the attorney at one point because I was tired of signing my name. I was like, you're going to owe me some fees by the end of this deal, all right? And so I just kept signing my name, signing my name. And I got to the final line 
on that last piece of paper, and they make you sign it because they want you to know what you're getting into. They want you to understand the consequences of what will happen if you don't repay this loan. And I got to the final blank with a little X and signature under it, and I began to think to myself, wait a second, what am I doing? Because what I am saying by signing this document is I'm saying that I'm going to repay a loan with terms that are longer than my entire lifespan to this point. What have I gotten myself into? And immediately I just became overcome by fear and anxiety. And I just kept asking myself that question, what have you gotten yourself into? Cameron, you can take that down now. Have you ever had a moment like that in your life before where anxiety just took you over? Maybe it was when you were standing there getting ready to marry the love of your life and you're standing at the altar and you're getting ready to say, I do or I will. And you began to think to yourself, what am I doing? What have I gotten myself into? What am I saying yes to? And maybe you didn't really know what you were saying yes to until you woke up a few weeks later and and your new wife or your new husband was nagging you because you don't put the cap on the toothpaste and like the end of the world's gonna come if you don't do that. Or maybe you had this moment when your first child was born and you waited for nine months for the birth of that little boy or that little girl. You waited with joyful anticipation. You could not wait for this new life to be born, for your family to grow. And then finally that day, that morning, that night, it came and that little child was born and there was just so much love and joy and excitement in the room that you couldn't contain yourself and you just began to weep as you held that little baby. And then when it was time for you and your wife to get some rest, you'd send the baby with the nurses back to the nursing station and they'd take care of it. But then a couple of days later, those nurses took that baby or those babies in their car seat and they placed it in your back seat and they waved at you as you drove off and said, good luck. And maybe it was when you were driving home on that day on the highway or the interstate or the causeway and you began to think to yourself, wait a second, what have I gotten myself into? What did I sign up for? And this morning, that's the question that I want to ask is, is do you know what you've gotten yourselves into? Do we know what we've gotten ourselves into when we said that we're going to put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ? When we said, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Show me the way. You're the Lord of my life. Do we know what it is that we've gotten ourselves into? Because whether you and I realize it or not, and if we don't right now, hopefully by the end of this sermon, we're going to know for sure by looking at this text today, as Christians, we have a responsibility. We signed up for something. We have a great responsibility in real, tangible, life-changing, life-altering circumstance, blowing them out of the water. We have a responsibility to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what we signed up for. In, um, in the book of Exodus, God, he gives these 10 commandments, right? He gives them to the Israelites. And you see, we tend to see these 10 commandments as, as 10 laws, 10 rules, 10 ways of God trying to keep people in line. But here's the thing. When we begin to see the context that he gives these commandments in, it completely changes the game. We go from seeing them being handed down and spoken by this life-stealing, you know, just fire-breathing dragon of a God who's trying to keep people in line, keep people, you know, doing the right things, living the right ways, to a God who's actually trying to give people life, to a God who's actually trying to give people an abundant life. Because the Israelites are people who don't know what it means to be human. The Israelites are a group of people that have been in slavery for generations. These people are born into slavery. They're not born into humanity. When you're a slave, you are stripped of the dignity that it means that it, to be human. And so you have sons who were born into this mindset and this mode that they don't know what it means to be a human, but they know what it means to be a slave. 
They don't know what it means that they're created in the image and likeness of God, but they know what it means to be a worker and to be a producer. And so when God speaks at Mount Sinai, (laughs) he's trying to teach the Israelites what it means to be human again. The first commandment that God speaks, he says this, he says, have no other gods. There are no other gods before me. I am the only one. The Israelites' ability to be human is directly related to their ability to remember their God. You see, because their liberation, which was a gift from God, if they forget God, If they forget the one true God that brought them out of slavery, then guess what? They forget their story. And if they forget their story, they forget who they are and where they come from, and most importantly, who saved them. And if they forget their God, they forget their story, they forget that they've been led out of slavery and into freedom, if they forget those things, if they forget the God who saved them, then they may find themselves one day in a completely different kind of slavery again. So God says, first and foremost, remember that I am your God. And the second commandment, he says this, it builds on that first one, and he says, no images in the form of anything. No images. Now, culturally, this is important because in the ancient Near East, the people used to paint pictures. They used to build statues. They used to erect sculptures that showed, it gave depth to the divine. And God says, number one, you cannot do me justice by building a statue or a sculpture of me. You can't put depth to this. I am too awesome, and I mean that word in the very truest sense of its word. I am too awesome to be contained by one statue. But number two, I I don't need a statue. I don't need an image. I don't need for you to to paint a picture or an image of who I am because I've already done that. I have you. You see, God, he's, he's beginning to invite them in to the work that he's doing. He's inviting them in to be partakers in his divine nature, in his divine work. And he's saying, I don't need a statue. I don't need a painting. I don't need a sculpture because I've got you. I've got you. This Exodus God isn't like any other God. And then there's this third commandment. And he says this, don't misuse the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't misuse the name of the Lord your God in vain. And this is the one that I want us to kind of hang out on a little bit here this morning um, because I feel like it's the most mis... We don't... We don't take it the way it's really intended to be. And, and so when God says, don't misuse my name, some words say, don't take my name in vain, that word for misuse, that word for to take, if you look in the Hebrew, it's actually a lot richer than that. It's actually a lot deeper than that because, I mean, think about the first commandment. No other gods. Think about the, the second commandment. No images. Don't you think it's kind of trivial that God would go, hey, don't say certain phrases? Don't you think that's kind of surface and shallow of God? And if we know anything about God, God's not surface level. God is not shallow. Now, yes, this commandment is very obviously about how we speak about God. But this commandment, when you begin to look into the, into the Hebrew and into the depth of this text, you'll find, text this, find, you'll find this word, nasah. And nasah is best translated as to carry. And so what God says here is don't carry my name in fame. Yeah, this, this, this line, this commandment, it is about how you speak about God. But what God says even more importantly, what God speaks is, don't take my name in vain. Don't proclaim to be a child of mine, a son or a daughter of mine. Proclaim to be free and still act like you're living under the bondage of slavery and sin. Don't proclaim to be a follower of my son, to be liberated and still act and live as though you are not. Because that is carrying my name in vain. But even more so, it's about this. It's about how Israel is going to carry itself to those who are still in slavery. 
Is Israel going to hear the cry of the oppressed? Is Israel going to hear the cry of the people in slavery? Because that's exactly what this God does. This God hears the cry of the oppressed. He hears the cry of the poor. And he doesn't just listen to them. No, he acts on their behalf. And so is Israel going to be active agents of redemption and liberation in other people's stories? And then we get this fourth commandment, and this is the last one we're going to talk about. It says this, it's to take a Sabbath day of rest and not do any work. Why? Because in Egypt, all the Israelites knew was work. Every day they would wake up and their worth was based off of how much they would produce. Their worth was based off of how many bricks they could make. How many of us in this room this morning, our worth is based off of how much money we make? How many of us in this room this morning, our worth is based off of how much money we have in our our IRA? How many of us in this room, our worth is based off of the house that we live in, the cars that we drive, the kind of toys that we have? And God speaks to the Israelites and he says this, you are not worth something because of what you make. You are worth something because of whose you are. So remember whose you are. Remember that you weren't led to let out of slavery on your own. It was I who did it for you. So take a day to rest and remember what I've done. And these first four commandments, they're the foundation and the basis for the other six. Because there's, there's this clear dividing line in one through four and six through ten at number five where it goes from, from the basis of it to everything else, six through ten, flows out of these first four. And it flows out of how to be in authentic community again. It, it flows out of the idea that God's trying to teach them a new way to be human. It flows out of the idea that there's a new way to live and move in the world, a new way to be in covenant with God who hears the cry of the oppressed, who hears the cry of those who are in slavery. And everything about the rest of the commandments, it speaks to that. It speaks to liberation. It speaks to freedom. Because God's inviting, because God is looking, he's looking for a body, for a group of people to be his hands and his feet in this world. A group of people who know what Egypt looks like and who speaks on the behalf of those who are in Egypt, who are still being oppressed, who are still being held captive. That's what God's looking for. Is a group of people who are going to lead others out of slavery and into freedom. Why else would it be so powerful for a recovering alcoholic to sit and have a conversation and to share in life with, on a daily basis, someone who struggles with alcoholism? Why else is it that it's so powerful for a woman who was once in an abusive relationship to share in life with and to walk alongside another woman who's in an abusive relationship? Why else is it so powerful that someone who has overcome an addiction, a drug addiction, a pornography addiction, a sex addiction, whatever, why else is it that that is so powerful for someone who has overcome that to speak and to share in life with someone who is currently in the midst of that? It's because somebody knows what Egypt looks like. It's because somebody knows what that kind of slavery feels like. And they know better than anyone else what it means to be led out of slavery, what it means to be led to freedom. They know better than anyone else. One of my favorite shows on TV right now is Extreme Weight Loss. Has anybody watched that? Awesome. Okay, there. I found this out last weekend when I preached this in big church. There was only one other person that watched it, so that makes four of us in the church now outside of Chad Haddad. So thank you for not making me feel like the biggest loser in the world. Um, so anyways, this show is about this, this man and this woman, Chris and Heidi Powell. They're, they're married. They're personal trainers. And it's about how they walk with people who are trying to lose weight. And we're not talking trying to lose a little bit of weight, like 15, 20 pounds. We're talking like they work with the obese of the obese of the obese of the obese, like four, five, 600-pound people. And they open their home to them and their life to them, and they walk with them. And, and they begin, in, in the beginning, they go and live with them, and they begin to peel back the layers in these people's lives as to why they are the way they are, why they eat the way they eat, what it is that they're actually feeding into deeper than just food and a love for it. 
because the obesity is just the symptom. But there's this one particular story that I saw about a year ago that just, it punched me right across the face. And it's the story of this 20-something-year-old girl named Alyssa, named Alyssa. And Alyssa, ever since the time she was a child, she struggled with her weight. She's fought with it. She's battled it. So she sends in her story, she gets chosen, she's picked, she goes to California and then to Arizona with Chris and Heidi, and, and there's this period of three months where they live with them, and, and they teach them how to do this, and how to work out, and how to eat right, and all that stuff, but they send them back home. And when Alyssa gets back home, she's caught in this tension of between what used to be and what is, and she begins grabbing onto and holding onto old life, her old ways of living, her old habits, tighter than ever before. Isn't it funny that when new creation begins to spring forth, that when, when new ways of living begin to take root, that old temptations begin to stare us down in our face more than ever before? And she does what we typically tend to do. We hold on really tight to what we know. We would rather stay in the swimming pool than get the vast mystery of the ocean. We would rather stay where it's safe, where what we know, even if what we know is killing us. And this girl went back to her old ways of eating. And she'd start her day every morning by eating two or three value meals for breakfast from McDonald's. But she knew a better way. And so she, she goes through three months and you know, there she goes to her next weight loss, you know, see if she's met her goal, and she gets there, and she steps on the scale, and she hasn't. She hasn't met her goal, and Chris asks her this one question, what happened? What happened? You were doing so well. And all of a sudden, you can see it in the depths, in, in the depths of her heart, because on the exterior, she just begins unraveling. She just begins falling to pieces and crying, and she looked at Heidi and she began to confess. Restoration always begins with confession. And she looks at Heidi and, and she says, every morning I would wake up and I would eat two to three value meals for breakfast. And there was so much shame and guilt inside of me that the only way that I knew to get it out of me was to throw up. And so now we have a woman who's not only struggling with obesity, but she's struggling with bulimia. And when she confesses this, Heidi just grabs her and holds her, and she begins to cry. Because what the viewer doesn't know and doesn't understand at this point is for Heidi, she knows the battle that Alyssa's about to face. She knows the fight that she's about to take part in because she herself fought for eight years to overcome this disease. And so she knew what it was going to take. And they invited this girl to come and live with them for the rest of the year, to show her new ways of life, to begin to peel back the layers on this new part of the process. I can't think of a better image of what it is for slavery to come up against freedom. I can't think of a better picture of what it is to not misuse the name of the Lord our God in vain. Because I think that's exactly what he had in mind when he said not to carry his name in vain. And every one of us gathered this morning, we know in some sort of fashion, in some way, what it is to be in slavery, what it is to be in slavery to someone or to something. Because each and every one of us in this room, we've been in Egypt be before, haven't we? We've been there before. And I can't make a, a blanket statement here, but hopefully, hopefully some of us have been led out of Egypt. Hopefully some of us have been liberated from Egypt and have been led to freedom. Because someone introduced us to a man. But not just any man fully man, but fully God. And that man, he became our redeemer. He became our liberator. He became our Lord and our God, Jesus, our Savior. I asked you a question earlier this morning. Do, do you know what you've gotten into? 
when you signed up to follow Jesus Christ, when you accepted him into your heart, when you prayed the prayer, when you were baptized and made your profession of faith and confirmed, I don't care how you did it, but when you said, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you, do you know what you signed up for? Do you know what you'd gotten yourself into? And better yet, do you know who you've gotten yourself into? And, and even more than that, do you know who's gotten into you? Who dwells in you? Because this morning, for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who proclaim to be saved by grace through faith, for those of us who say proudly that you and I were Christians, we're followers of the way, do you know that when you said yes to Jesus, what it was you were getting into? The scriptures say that we're a holy nation, that we're a royal priesthood, that we're a people that's set apart. That being a Christian, it's not just about wearing a label. It's not just about wearing the t-shirts or carrying the crosses or listening to Caleb. It's so much more than that. It's so much richer than that. That being a Christian, it's about becoming more like Christ. That it's about saying some of the things that he said. And it's about doing the things that he himself did. Because when we get a glimpse and a taste of his love, it compels us. When we get a taste of what freedom is like, we want it for others. And it causes us to want to carry this message to them of a God who is chasing after them, pursuing them, who wants to liberate and free them. The love of Christ compels us. It causes us to want freedom and liberation for others. It does. And so it's about becoming more like him, saying things that he would say, doing the kinds of things that he would do. But Jesus said this, and if you don't believe me, go check out John chapter 14, verse 12. He even said it, that as we become more like him, as we are... (laughs) living in the world and being light in the world, that we're going to begin doing greater things than even he did. Greater things. I want to throw the responsibility this morning of all of the issues that you think of when you say the world is broken back on our shoulders, but ultimately on the shoulders of Christ. Because I believe more than any other group or demographic of people in this world, we, the church, have the greatest responsibility to love our neighbors as ourselves. More than Boys and Girls Club of America, more than any other organization that's doing great work that you can think of to help the underprivileged, more more than Compassion International, more than 410 Bridge, more than any other organization or anything like that, I believe that we, the church, have the greatest responsibility of all to do the work of God to free and to liberate people. Why? Why do we have that that responsibility? Why do we have the greatest responsibility? Because we're the people of God and we're called to do the will of God. You and I have the responsibility to carry the name of his Lord, to carry the name of our Lord. We have the responsibility to lead others out of the tyranny and slavery of their Egypts. We have a responsibility to hear the cry of the poor and the oppressed and not just hear their cries, but to do something about it. Because being a Christian, it isn't just about me being let out of slavery. Being a Christian isn't just about my freedom. Being a Christian is about leading others to freedom, leading others to Jesus. God speaks to Abraham and he says, Abraham, you have been blessed to bless others. If my salvation, if my freedom is only about me, then I have missed the second half of the gospel. The great commission is there for all of us. And having reverend in front of our name or our office at the church isn't the qualification to go and make disciples. It isn't the qualification to go and lead people out of slavery. It's the great commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love the Lord your God, if he calls you son or daughter, 
if you professed your faith in his son. That's it right there. If you're not qualified, you are now commanded to go. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says this, when the Son and the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He'll sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All of the nations will be gathered before Him and He'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd shepherds the sheep from His goats. He'll put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers of mine, You did for me. Church, you've been blessed to be a blessing. You've been called to go forth and to liberate and to free those who are in Egypt. You have been called to love your neighbor as yourself. Freely we've received, freely we should give. Last week, um, a friend of mine was telling me this story about how there was a young family here in Mandeville um, who they, they had some extra space in their house, and they heard of this young woman who needed a place to stay for a little while. She was in between living situations. And so this young woman comes in and stays at their house, and kind of the way that it went was this girl was told, you know, you're not going to give us anything. You don't have to pay for lights. You don't have to pay for anything at all, Re- food in the refrigerator, the pantry. What's, what's ours is yours kind of thing. That was the arrangement. And so one night, this girl is sitting there talking with this other young lady, and, and they're sitting on the couch just kind of sharing their stories a little bit. And all of a sudden, this young woman begins to spill her heart about how for months she had been praying that God would take her out of her current living situation. For months, she had been praying that God would take her out of that because it wasn't healthy and it wasn't good. And how he did. But when he did and she didn't know where she was going to go, she began praying, God, would you give me a place to say, would you put a roof over my head? And she's sitting there telling this story to this other young woman. And as she's telling the story, she looks at her and she says, and you were the answer to my prayer. You are my blessing. Church, be someone's blessing. You are the answer to someone's prayer. The question is, are you going to be the answer? Are you going to be available? God can do so much if we're only available. Be someone's blessing. Every year we send our students to this camp called Big Stuff. Um, And last week I was getting ready, uh, and and they threw this image up on their Facebook. Cameron, if you can throw that up there. On their Facebook, they posted this picture, and um, 651 children have been sponsored this year. They've, they've partnered with this organization called Compassion International, and essentially what Compassion does is this, is, is that they try and partner uh, with the local church in third world countries and third world communities in these small villages where people are living in poverty, and they try and make sure that every kid ha- is going to have an education and every kid is going to be fed. And so this year, 651 students, they were at Camp 5 at the, or Camp five of 8 at this point, 651 children around the world in poverty-stricken situations did not have to worry about where food was going to come from for the rest of the year. Because some junior high or high school student said, you know what, I'm not going to have that Coke every day. I can save 38 bucks that way. Or I'm not going to go to the movies four or five times a month. I- I'm only going to go once. Heck, that'll save 70 bucks right there. You know, and I'm not going to go out to eat with my friends three or four times a week. Maybe maybe I'll only go once or twice a month. And students are sacrificially giving so that someone else can have the basic needs. 
Matt, can you throw that picture back up? Because I love what they said about this. They said, we want your thoughts to go from someone should do something about this to I'm going to do something about this. When you think about carrying the name of the Lord your God in vain, I want our thoughts to go from seeing and eating thinking, wow, somebody should do something, to seeing and eating saying, I'm going to do something. You are the answer to the prayers. You are someone's blessing. Now be it. Live into your identity. Jesus, in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, he teaches this lesson that we learn in kindergarten. He says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. When you see in Egypt, do something about it. Remember that there was a time and there was a day when you yourself, you were sitting right there in Egypt in the bondage of slavery. Remember that because of the grace of God, you were liberated. Remember your God so that you'll remember your story. Remember how someone intervened on your behalf. So make the bride beautiful and intervene on theirs. And whatever you do, whatever you do, don't take, don't misuse, don't carry the name of the Lord your God in vain. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning... um, and we see needs all around us. I pray that you would continue to open our eyes um, (laughs) to the lost. I pray that you would continue to open our eyes to those who are in suffering. I pray that you would continue to open our eyes to those who are in prison, those who are thirsty, and those who are hungry. And I pray that we would tap into the power, into the spirit that already dwells within us, the same spirit that liberated us, that freed us, the same spirit (laughs) that urges us to go and make disciples of all nations, I pray that we would respond and that we wouldn't carry or take or misuse the name of the Lord our God in vain. Jesus, we love you. Amen. starts from within and seeking him um, and knowing he is the foundation of all we are when we don't feel like we have enough courage or we have enough strength or we're too weak or we're overwhelmed he remedies all those things and so it's our heart's desire to seek him and with everything we have starting from in here and letting it come outwards through his spirit so we're going to stand together um, and sing these words this morning Times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again? Well, I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond.
that justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Don't come, you will above all else. My purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you to raise everlasting. Your light will shine with all else space, never ending. Your glory goes beyond. Thing, yeah. My heart and my soul we do, Lord, I give you control Consume me from the inside out My Lord, let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the